a little change in the lithology, but at least I've got a starting point for what to expect for a geologic section. Boy, does that give me a leg up on how to drill wells and how to find oil and gas. So again, regional correlations are kind of important. Okay, so that's relative time. Kind of some neat tricks, how to, how to use it, and how you can apply these, these uh, techniques to figure out time and rocks and how they fit together. Think about it, when you walk outside, you're walking on an unconformity. There's a gap in time right there, time walk. So how will that show up in the geologic record someday? Okay, let's shift gears now and talk about absolute time. Instead of that parking meter that says, put in more money, I'll give you some more time, as relative sense, now it's gonna tell me, okay, put in 15 cents, and I'll give you a little bit of time back to the, through the sentence <coughs> over. But if you give me 35 cents, I'll take you all the way back to the Jurassic. And if you give me $6.75, I'll take you back to the Archean, the pre -Kindred. Now, we're assigning specific times and specific ages. Okay, I'm going to draw on the knowledge of physics and chemistry here for a minute. True and false of the player. The nucleus of an atom is composed of protons and neutrons. 20 seconds. <coughs> Everybody kind of is headed toward uh, truth. Right. And that is true. What we're going to talk about a little bit is the idea, and it really was an idea that started in the late 19 or early 1900s, really didn't come to fruition until about the mid 1930s, culminated to a certain point. Uh, in the development of the atomic bomb of 1945, and since then has been greatly expanded upon. But this idea of atomic structure and how atoms are put together. Now, since then, we've kind of gotten to the point where uh, we've found even smaller particles than atoms and smaller particles than the things that make up atoms. We're getting into quarks and quarks and all sorts of things. Uh, but we're not going to get to that level. We're going to keep it at kind of basic atomic theory. Okay? But we, we don't need to get too carried away. But if you're really into this stuff, uh, there's some good physics and some good chemistry classes that, that go into this certainly want to read physics in particular. Let's just kind of quickly review uh, an atom. The idea is that it has a nucleus or a central part that is made up of protons, which are positively charged particles, and neutrons, which like their name implies, are neutral. But the neutrons and the protons, uh, neutrons in particular, have most of the mass of the atom. That's where the weight occurs. Around this nucleus are electrons, negatively charged particles. And they're usually shown as being in shells, although it's not really a solid shell. It's an individual little electron spinning around the nucleus. So if you were just to watch its, its path and have it draw out its path, it would eventually create a, a shell of, of a imaginary line. So if I have an atom that is neutrally charged, no, no positive, no negative charge, it means that the protons in the nucleus equal the number of electrons in the shells. And that is kind of a good starting point. If I 
lose an electron, that means I'm losing a negative charge, so I would end up with what we call an ion of a plus one charge. If I, for some reason, lost a proton, then I'd have a negative charge. So I can modify these atoms. They are all, all the same. We keep track of these things, and we organize them in the periodic table. Mendeleev did that. Absolutely brilliant. And even though it kind of scared us all when we took chemistry in high school, um, it's the kind of thing that once you've used it a little bit, it just becomes so brilliant and so obvious. Two numbers that set everything uh, up in the periodic table, and the first is the atomic number. That is simply the number of protons in the nucleus. So as I start, the very simplest atom that I've got out there is hydrogen. It's got one proton in the nucleus, and it means it's got one electron buzzing around it with a negative charge to balance out that positive proton. The next most complex thing is helium. I've got two protons in the nucleus with two electrons. But it's the number of protons, that's what I'm looking at here in the nucleus. And we just go one, two, three, four, five. We just keep marching up in complexity as we keep adding the protons to the nucleus. Now we've also got neutrons in the nucleus, right? And the atomic mass number is the number of protons and neutrons. Most of the mass is the neutron. The proton does contribute mass. So together, that's essentially, well, I guess you could kind of unofficially say that's the weight of the atom. And that's going to be more than the atomic number. And it gets more different as we march up in complexity. OK, so two ways of tracking uh, where all these guys should occur. Okay, so one of the things that I find is despite the fact that I've got everything ordered, here's hydrogen, here's helium, here's lithium, uh, you know, I'm just marching right up in order. What Mendeleev figured out was how do these things react? What are they going to react with? And he put them in columns so that Golly, everything in this column, regardless of the fact that it has a different atomic number, it all reacts about the same way. In fact, this column here is the noble gases. This is uh, also known as the inert gases because they don't like to react with anything. They're very hard to get them to do anything. And there's a reason for that. It's their atomic configuration. They have the perfect balance with electrons and protons. They have no openings for more electrons in their outermost shell. It's full. So it doesn't need to get any electrons. It doesn't need to get rid of any extra electrons. It's got just the right number of electrons in the outer shell, which happens to be eight. And with eight electrons in its outer shell, no matter how many shells it has, as long as the outer one is filled with eight, it's going to be very non-reactive. And this is kind of why he's got all these guys together here. And yet, it's kind of neat because these guys all have increasing atomic numbers. It just means they have more and more shells to accommodate all those electrons and therefore protons but the outer shell is always full. And so here are all the metals. These guys, they've got to share electrons all over the place to make, make uh, their outer shell full. And for that reason, they're very real. Now, we have something that we call an isotope. Okay, An iso equal place. It kind of means we're taking an atomic number 
and we're going to leave the number of protons the same, we're going to leave the number of electrons the same, but I'm going to stick in a different number of neutrons into the nucleus. So I'm not charge, changing the charge on the unit, and I'm not going to change the atomic number, but I am going to change the atomic mass number, aren't I? Because I'm sticking in those heavy neutrons. So I've made an isotope of that same element. I haven't changed the element. It's still got the same atomic number. Okay, but it's going to behave differently, don't you think? Okay. Isotopes have the same atomic number but different atomic mass numbers. This can only happen by changing the number of what? 20 seconds. See a few of you are starting to drift off a little way or so I thought I'd kind of catch your attention. Okay. Looks like these are the popular ones. Neutrons, absolutely. Changing the mass number, but I'm not going to mess around with the number of protons. Because if I mess with those, then I've changed the atomic number, and that's a different element. So that's not an isotope. That's a whole different, different material. Let's look at hydrogen. OK, hydrogen, remember, is our simplest atom out there. One proton, one electron. I can take an extra neutron and stick it in to the nucleus of that hydrogen atom uh, to accompany that one proton. What I've just done now is I've changed the atomic weight from one to an atomic weight of two. But I've still only got one proton in the nucleus, so it's still hydrogen. But it's heavy hydrogen. It's what we call deuterium. Now, I can do this again. For some reason, hydrogen will let you do it. And you can stick in a second neutron. So now the nucleus has two neutrons, one proton, still one proton. It's still atomic number one. It's still hydrogen. And it's got two neutrons. Now it has an atomic weight of three. And we call this tritium. Tri, three. You've probably heard of deuterium and tritium. These are the radioactive things that you get out of a dirty atomic bomb. They're the things that will do damage to you. So why will they do damage to you and just plain old hydrogen won't? Well, the only thing you've changed is the atomic mass number, right? You've made this molecule or this um, atom heavier. So now when it goes zipping through, it has mass. That mass has inertia. And when it gets moving, it can go through stuff. Hydrogen isn't going to go through you unless you're doing some weird thing under pressure. But deuterium and tritium are heavier. And they can actually atom can zip right through you, and when they zip right through you, they do damage. They change chromosomes, and given enough of them, will produce organ failure. So you don't want to get hit with that stuff. Now, we have this kind of radiation around us everywhere. There's a certain level that is just in the background that we live with. We don't get too much of it here in Kalamazoo. But if I were to move out to Denver into the Rocky Mountains, I would get twice as much out there that I get here in Kalamazoo. How does that happen? Laws of nature. Laws of nature. Well, yeah, it's laws of geology, actually. The main reason is that a lot of this radiation is given off as granites break down into clays. Potassium, in particular, breaking down into argon gas. 
And in that process, it gives off isotopes. So I would get, uh, in particular, a uh, higher dose of radon than I would get here. Here we have little pockets where you get higher doses, but that's because in the gravel that make up the glacial deposits here, we've got more granite debris uh, that was brought down by the glaciers from Canada. And you know, some of that's deposited here and there. So in those areas, we do have higher radon readings. But for most of it, it's just sands and gravels. It's ground up sedimentary rock from the lower part of Michigan. And that's not going to break down like granites do in the radon. The way a lot of this was kind of really driven home was back in the 70s. There's a guy out in Pennsylvania that worked in a nuclear power plant. And you know how you have to carry around those badges and you turn them in every couple weeks and they check to make sure you haven't been getting a lethal dose of radiation in the plant? Well, he turned his in, as you always did, every two weeks, and his readings were off the charts. And they kind of went, whoa, we got a problem. And they couldn't figure out where he was getting this, this radiation dose. And they followed him around through the plant all day. They discovered that he wasn't getting it at the nuclear plant. He was getting it at home <laughs> and setting it off when he came back in. So they said, what are you doing at home? Well, it turned out he'd just finished off his basement into a rec room. So he was now sitting in his basement in the evening, having an adult beverage and watching the game on TV. And they said, hmm. Well, it turns out his basement was dug, on the back side of it was dug into a granite cliff face. And because there wasn't much ventilation in the basement, the radon gas that was escaping from the breakdown of that granite was accumulating in his basement. It wasn't being vented out. <laughs> the radon levels were going sky high. And it was enough to set off his radiation badge. So at that point, they kind of went, <laughs> this isn't very good. And immediately, all the banks said, hey, if you've got radi uh, uh, radon in your basement, we're not going to give you a mortgage. We don't want to be responsible for that. So that, of course, meant just about everybody had to get worried about radon. And they developed systems that you put in your basement now that vent out and recirculate the air. It's a, you know, a couple thousand bucks to fix. It's mostly just ventilation. And that way, the, the radon that's there never builds up and gets vented out fresh air comes in. So increases your heating bill a bit, but better than, than getting a little in the dark. Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of radiation background that we all live with. And here we don't have that much because we don't have that much granite. Okay, so how do these isotopes, these high energy particles, uh, form? There are three different ways we can do this. First is what we call alpha emission. Think of this as the nucleus of an atom. And the blue circles are protons, so they have a plus charge. The brown ones are neutrons, and they're neutral. So rather than thinking of no charge, think in terms of both a positive and a negative that offset each other. So I hit this thing, and I force two protons and two neutrons to escape from this, this nucleus. Well, what is this? <coughs> what has two protons in its nucleus? What element? Helium. Helium, yeah. So I have just kicked off a particle of helium from this nucleus, so I've decreased the atomic mass number by four. I've kicked out two neutrons, two protons, total four, and I've changed its atomic mass number by two as I kicked out those two protons. So I made a whole different element here. Well, this alpha, there are this alpha particle, this helium now goes screaming off, and it bangs into something else. 
So in this case, we see this uh, 